What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Destination of the Show. This is episode 49. Um, after a brief hiatus, my name is Jamie Cameron, back with Jeremy Nygaard once again. Jeremy, it's been a long time, man. Like, for real, for real. We actually haven't talked, like, in person for a couple of weeks. How are you? I'm 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 doing all right. Um, I'm more intrigued by why when one goes on a European vacation, he goes to Slovenia. Dude, if you're gonna if you're gonna make fun, then at least pronounce the name of the country correctly. It is Slovenia, not really? Slovenia. Yep. Um, because it's a hidden gem, dude. It's uh, it's really beautiful. It's like um, have you? Can you like picture like Switzerland in your head? It's like mountainous, like lakes, like really Jeez. green, huh? No, not nothing. Uh, anyway, that's what that's what Slovenia looks like, man. It's just beautiful outdoor space, outdoor scenery. Um, so why, it. so why not Switzerland? Well, Switzerland is incredibly expensive, and Slovenia is not incredibly expensive, and we just so happen to find very reasonably priced flights to Slovenia until the ultimate travel nightmare that was <laughs> trying to get there, which I don't know if we want to dig into that. I, I want to hear this. I need to hear this. <laughs> okay. I'll try and give you the edited highlights, right? So we're flying out in a two. This is only a six day vacation. It's this full day of travel. So time is of the essence. We are scheduled to have an early morning flight excuse me, a mid-afternoon flight, but it's a connection, right? So you go to Chicago and then Chicago to um, to Germany, Germany to Slovenia. We, as we're leaving for the airport, get a notification that our first flight to Germany has been canceled. Okay. Didn't ever leave Europe because of a mechanical failure. Not weather, not anything crazy. That plane just didn't take off. So we rushed down to the airport to try and figure out like an alternative solution. And they say, actually, we found like a pretty decent solution for you guys. It would actually get you into Slovenia only about six hours after you were scheduled to. And we're like, wow, that sounds like a, about a best case scenario. But it's on United, not on the airline you were on previously. So we go back and forth between the United and the Lufthansa counter and their staffs are literally arguing with each other about who is supposed to help us get seats on this new alternative flight. By the time they figured it out, that flight is now full. Okay. <laughs> so the next the next solution is they send us to Denver, which is the wrong way. Um, and then, pretty, I mean, that's a pretty city. Sure. And then Denver to Germany and Germany to Slovenia. Now we're looking at like 12 to 18 hours after we're supposed to get in on a, a six day vacation. So go to Denver. No problem. Denver to Munich and Germany. Get to Munich. And we're about to board our flight for Ljubljana, which is the capital of Slovenia. And then 15 minutes before that plane starts boarding, we get another notification that that flight's been canceled due oh. to crazy, crazy weather. Legitimately, dude, a two hour wait just to get to the front of the customer service line. And there were people going absolutely ham in a variety of European languages <laughs> <laughs> on these poor customer service yeah. uh, folks from Lufthansa because that was crazy weather all over Central Europe and all these flights were getting canceled. So it was like a two hour wait they finally got us on another flight to Frankfurt, which is not closer. It's just a different German city. Right. And we stayed there overnight. And then we're back at the airport in at like 7 a.m. in the morning to get a flight to Ljubljana. So we ended up getting in a full 24 hours after we were supposed to, two canceled flights, um, just the general kind of like stress of trying to figure out all of that stuff out. It was a complete disaster. And then like day two, I got COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it wasn't great. Um, and I think that can only be matched by your, the beginning of your school year, which uh, involves buses and transportation yeah. and 
getting kids to school and back from school on time and safely. How's that going? I did. I didn't cancel any flights. <laughs> um, there was no two-hour wait to customer service. Oh my god. Um, I mean, there was unhappy people, um, but those those show up in the forms of emails, which is fine. Yeah. Um, you know, a bunch of phone calls, but it's like if we can locate your kid, which we can do almost all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll get we'll get your kid home, and it'll only get better. We got 190 days to to perfect this. So yeah. you had six, and your first two were ruined, and then you got sick. I got 100 and 190. It, it'll be just fine. So things are looking better for you than for me, is what I'm hearing. Speaking of disgruntling experiences, and I, I get the feeling that you haven't been able to watch much Twins baseball, just because I know. How crazy the beginning of the school year is. We both work in education. Have you dipped your toes in the water of much Minnesota Twins baseball recently? Have you have you been able to watch this very, very poorly executed streak that they're on at the moment? So <clears throat> I went to the Zebby debut. Nice. Uh, um, I don't know exactly when that was because every day just seems like the same day <laughs> as the last one. Um <laughs> So I went to the Zebby debut. He pitched well. Mm -hmm. um, that was against the Royals, right? Yep. The series after that was that the the a while back, man. Was that the Guardian series? I don't know, dude. We get, yeah, we got the Theo, other thing. Is, Theo, pop in. Theo, Theo always knows. Just Theo, okay. Just, just, just pop in. Up. Yeah, it was Cleveland then Kansas City. Okay, so. Wait, so was the, the Cleveland doubleheader, was that before Zebby? That, that was the Friday before Zebby's debut, yeah. Okay, so they split with those. I was watching that, and then Zebby debuts, and so they, they played the Royals. And then who was after that? San Diego? After that, they went to Texas, mm. and then yeah, I don't remember those the last three series, of that which have been miserable. As... Yeah. So the Padres were late, so I yeah. tried, kind of watched a little bit of that. Um, they won that last game, right? That It was like a late day game. Yeah, yeah. And then after that series was St. Louis Cardinals. Yeah, yeah. They, took one, they won one of those, right? They won the Saturday night game. Yeah, they beat Sonny. Sonny produced a draft pick. Like that sounds promising. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I haven't. I haven't really got to watch a lot. Um, and also, I haven't been like even keeping up to date on Twitter. So games happen, and I don't even know. I know nothing. And so mm -hmm. I'm. I'm pretty optimistic that this is still a playoff team. Um, because they're 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 short on health, and that will be better. Um, the experience of their of their rookie pitchers is promising, right? Uh, Fest has been been I think as good as anybody could have hoped. Zebby will be will be just fine. Um, Sim Richardson is a is turning out to be a very very like wow this is a this is a real thing that he's going to be a starting pitcher. Yep. Uh, I did watch Bailey Ober's performance the other night Ooh. Uh, in the seven minutes of, of baseball that I watched. <laughs> yeah, they should have delayed and, that one from the start. And 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 he he's gonna be fine too. Like, and that's the thing. Like, and and I we talked about this before we started. Like, their starting pitching's been good. Their bullpen. Oh my gosh. Um, painful. Yeah, Tre Trevor was it Trevor Richards? It was nice yep. knowing you. You know, we yep. knew you. Um, <laughs> That is is like if you get paid to throw the baseball, how can you possibly throw the, the baseball that poorly? Yeah, it was bad. Um, and you know what? I'm a little perturbed by this, Jeremy, that you are like the beacon of positivity on this show because you're normally the no. negative and, and cranky one. <laughs> um, but I'm I'm glad you brought up the rookie pitchers because I think the one like real positive you've got to take from this stretch, like more so for next year and beyond, is you have three fifths homegrown rookies in your rot rotation right now. And for the most part, I know David Fest's last start before this one wasn't great, but this one was awesome. He looked oh, really, really tonight. good tonight. Zebby's looked great. SWR has been consistent all season. I mean, that bodes so well for the twins having a controllable, high quality, 
young starting rotation for the next cheap. half decade. Cheap, yep, yeah, uh, which increasingly is a consideration. Um, that feels so encouraging. But yeah, like you said, the bullpen has just been absolutely abject. I have no words yeah, to so, describe it. So here's my, here's always been my belief with with a bullpen. Like, invest dollars into a bullpen. That's always been my, if you have guys that, if you, if you have, if you develop, say, a dozen starters, some of those guys are, are going to fail and then turn out to be really, really good bullpen arms. Griffin Jacks, right? He came up as a starter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's maybe, I mean, he's in the top, he's in the conversation as the top reliever in baseball. I would consider he's the top him the 10 top. easily. Yeah. Not sure. Easily. Uh, John Duran was a, was a reliever until he hurt his shoulder and then, became a, a relief pitcher, I think, at AAA. Mm -hmm. Not been great this year, but he's been really good, like, mm -hmm. for his career. The teams that invest in relievers, and think about the, of what the Twins have done by investing in relievers lately. Working backwards, Trevor Richardson, or Trevor Richardson's small investment, trash. Um, all the guys they threw money at this offseason. Jay Jackson. Just on. Um, out. Yep. Um, uh, they traded for Okert. Mm -hmm. like junk 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 um who have they traded for who have they given assets for up uh, in the in the past uh Jorge Lopez yeah how bad was that and Sam Dyson mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. just stop yeah. stop doing anything but taking young guys and making them bullpen arms so you talked about hey we got three-fifths of the rotation gonna be these rookie the the other positive that comes out of that is Louis Varland is going to be a relief pitcher he was a reliever tonight. No. So Jeff Branham was the opener for the St. Paul Saints through a couple innings. And then Louie came in for lawn relief, pretty much through five innings out of, as a start. I would definitely say once the rosters expand come Sunday, mm -hmm. he's going to be back. And if it's not him, I think they have Josh Winder just to give him a little more of a ramp up time in the bullpen. So Josh one of those two is going to be up on Sunday but, easily. But, but those are both great examples of guys that it's like we peg them to be starters. And they're just – they're not going to be starters and they're going to be cheap relievers for six years. So who are those guys knocking on the door right now? Yeah. Andrew Morris. Yeah. Right. We want him to be a starter. He might not be a starter. Corey Lewis. We want him to be a starter. He might not be a starter. Marco Raya. No, he's definitely right? a reliever. Don't get me started on his innings but limit. He's a reliever. It does, it does, sure. Um, so you have Raya, then you have, um, some of these names are escaping me because all I see is, is bus numbers. Uh, CJ Culpepper, Jalen Nolan. Those are yep, a couple Pierce others. Mole. Like, yep. all of these guys are better investments than the, the trash that you're going to find on the scrap heap. And, and, and that's, that, that I guess is, is a poor use of those words because for me, I would rather, I would rather look for scrap heap guys than, than paying, four million dollars per year uh remember what's his face he Coleman? signed a two-year deal Addison Reed. 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 Yep. yeah that, the only think reliever they signed for two years think yeah. about like just stop doing it and i've been saying it since seth and i used to do our our google hangout like stop investing at at like actual resources or assets into relief pitchers just yeah. develop pitchers and when they suck as starters, making relief pitchers, and they can be really good. Tyler Duffy, like Tyler Duffy, was a really good starting pitcher for half the season, and then was a really good relief pitcher until he got to the point where they're like, you know what, he's not worth it. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point, and I certainly agree. And I think it it, it, dovet it dovetails nicely, right, with what the Twins do well as an organization. Like, what do they do well developmentally? Well, like, add velocity to fastballs. That's going to play up in a bullpen help guys develop a power breaking ball that's going to play up in a bullpen i think the thing to build up what you're saying jeremy that i would maybe like to see them do is like follow that approach with a little bit more decisiveness than they have done to date right and so like this season i think we're seeing the confluence of just like everything going wrong like it, it feels pretty unlikely that the five guys they ended up picking up would all just be completely unusable. Maybe that's not the norm, but 
it would be nice if some of these starters maybe turned relievers got into relief a little bit earlier when they're up with the Saints and and maybe on the tail end of their their time with Wichita because it feels like a little bit of an afterthought, you know? Like Louis Varlin this year is a stopgap to solve a really big problem. Like the Twins are going absolutely nowhere in the playoffs if they don't have a capable bull, bullpen beyond Jackson Duran. And it just seems like the conversion of some of these guys is a little bit of a, a last minute thought. And I get wanting to keep guys as starters as long as possible. But Jax, who you cited, is a great example. He wasn't a top 10 reliever in baseball overnight. It's taken two, three, four seasons for him to slowly get to that point of being a high leverage guy and being one of the best guys in the bigs. Yeah, Cole Sands too. But mm-hmm. what part of that, I think, has to do with the problems that we've seen that the Twins face in general, and that is that they've been horrible at developing pitchers historically. And that has changed recently. And because they've been so bad at it, there's been no like actual depth. Mm-hmm. And for the first time, I think we're realizing some of that depth and so guys like, and I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not saying anything, you know, I'm, I'm going to throw you some names, but not necessarily in specific roles. Guys like Andrew Morris mm-hmm. or CJ Culpepper could become those relievers. And I think you said, well, they didn't become that way overnight. Listen, Griffin Jacks was not as highly regarded as a prospect as Zebby Matthews. He was on the top. For sure. Prospects. Cole Sands shouldn't have been on the 26 man roster when he was again, why lack of any depth. And so like, it's, it's a bad, it's a bad time right now. What what are they two and eight in their last 10? Something like that. And so we look at that and you're like, they're never gonna, you know, you'd say playoffs. It's like, well, they're still kind of in the playoffs. They're not going to have success in the playoffs in a three game series on the road without, without their bullpen being able to do anything. Right. But when you look at, at it from a, kind of a, a long-term big picture it's like there's actually guys that could fill these roles there's more high high level minor league depth um and they just have to stop looking for it and i think you know everybody was like well who are they going to add to the bullpen who are they going to add to the bullpen they could have done it with some of these younger guys because yeah. we tur- you turn on the tv and any team it's like where did they get these guys you mm-hmm. know just the bullpen a flame throwing you know, six foot dudes. And it's like, wow, who are these guys? And the twins have them. We just don't ever see them. And then Brock Stewart gets hurt. They do. And and I do think they've had more than their fair share of either bad luck or bad health this year. Like Topa, another example of a guy who was supposed to be like at least a medium leverage role. I guess I, my hope is that we adjust after this year and plan a little bit more proactively because the last two years to me, right, it's felt like, oh, last year, Paddock and Varlam were just going to throw him in the pen. It worked out pretty great in the postseason. Right. This year, they're in a way deeper hole at the moment because Alcala looks terrible. It literally only looks like Sands, Jackson, Duran, and, and Duran's been shaky. Or, or the only three been, guys. Theobar's great. Line. Theobar's been bad. But, I mean, <clears throat> when you think about just knocking things down the wrong, Joe Ryan getting hurt yep. hurts things. Uh, but going back to the very beginning of the year, like Di Sclafani wasn't going to be the answer. <laughs> Forgot about him. But you know what he was going to be? He was going to be an arm that maybe could throw right. some innings. And, and mm-hmm. so that when you have to move everybody up the ladder, that mm-hmm. that's the problem. If Chris Paddock is healthy and Di Sclafani is healthy, Louis Varland is a bullpen guy all year. And then you've so, got Festa maybe to slot in at the end of the year. And, and then you you have Zebby down a rung, and you're mm-hmm. like, man, what's he going to be next year? And so that's what's that's what's hard. And I don't think it's abnormal. Like the the Twins aren't don't have the worst luck in the world. It's just a bummer because you've seen how good they can be. Yep. In spurts, and it's like, man, this team's real. What was it, eleven wins in a row or whatever? Like mm-hmm. this, this could be a World Series contender. And now we've seen the worst, and it's like this team's not going to make the playoffs. And there's somewhere Bring in between. Yeah. Um, and if Pablo comes, I think Pablo pitches tomorrow, right? So 
Pablo comes back with another game like he pitched last time, and then all day off. Day off tomorrow, thankfully. Oh, so they does he pitch? What's it? Friday then? Friday. That that he pitches, and all of a sudden people are like, okay, yeah, Pablo still got it, and if we right. have him, he can sneak into the playoffs. Yep. And so yeah, I think there's obviously things that aren't great, but there's also a lot of reasons to not lose all hope. Mm-hmm. Agreed, hundred percent. Never as good as when you're at your best. Never as bad as when you're at your worst. Um, having done our little complainathon session at the beginning here, um, before we jump into our our kind of overarching topics for the day, just some quick notes, ways that you can support the show because we have been a little bit offline for the past two weeks. Really, since post draft, we've been laying low a little bit and recovering. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at DTS underscore Pod One. We have an email address where you can send questions as destination the show at gmail.com. You can find us on YouTube. That's at destination the show. Any positive reviews and ratings you want to give us on your preferred podcasting platform of choice will be thoroughly appreciated as we look to continue to grow the show into our second year. That feels kind of weird to say. Um, but I figured, Jeremy, maybe we can whip through some like news and notes first because <clears throat> you and Theo recorded one when I was on vacation, but we are, I, I think it's safe to say a little kind of out of the loop or just behind on general twins system news. And there's been a lot going on. And so I want to, I want to hit you with some news and notes, some of which is newer, some of which is older and just get some of your, your takes on this stuff to make sure we cover it all. And we're kind of caught up on stuff. Um, so first of all, Luke Kieschel, um, now a consensus top 100 prospect, which is wild stuff, honestly, um, fr from being a second round pick in 2023 to being a consensus top 100 prospect, uh, out for the season after Tommy John surgery, um, sounds like this was planned for scheduled by the twins. Um, it makes a lot of sense because... He was having challenges throwing this year, but spent a lot of time playing DH. Um, any major concerns here for Kieschel after Tommy John? And then just like, what's your take on his kind of first full season in professional baseball? Yeah, um, I don't have any, any huge concerns. I think when he was as good as he was, as quick as he was, I think mm -hmm. it caught people off guard. If he has just an average run of the mill year and then the twins announce hey, he's gonna have Tommy John surgery, the fans will be like, Oh, okay, he'll be back next year and then, you know, get healthy and then he can, you know, potentially compete for a spot in the majors in like twenty twenty six. Well he he comes out on fire. And I think the the reality was it's like, is he gonna how high is he gonna make it this year? How much is he in the conversation to start Yep. 2025 or, or quickly be with the twins in 2025. And so that's kind of the bummer, right? Because he's not going to be in the mix to be starting at second base in April. And I think the reality is, is that he's in the mix to be an everyday player as soon as he's healthy. Yep. And that's a pretty sweet development. Um, and so it's a bummer from that perspective, but he's still a type of guy that you look at and you're like, well, he could be a regular in, in pretty short order. And when you yep. have those guys, that's, that's good for the, for the program. So yep. um, bummer that it happened, but I mean, I think the twins handle it really well. And it was just, uh, it was on a news dump day where all of it yeah. was bad. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you, man. I mean, this is great planning. Sounds like he's going to be ready for the beginning of the 2025 season. And just to, just to tie a bow on his season, right. Where um, he started at, at high a, made the jump to double A, hit 303, 420, 483. That's good for a 903 OPS. Struck out just 17% of the time, walked 13% of the time. I mean, that's just that's just about as good as you could possibly hope for, I think, from, from Kieschel. So absolutely monster season. Um, all right, here's my second talking point. Where is Emmanuel Rodriguez? Um, I mean, I would joke and say striking out somewhere, but he's not even getting that. <laughs> Dude, I, I okay, it's so hand, right, it's a he hurt his hand, yeah, and he fell off the face of the earth. 
it's a recur it's been a recurring thing right so he started rehab and then he re-aggravated i believe he's aggravated this twice but a couple of people have asked me this week and i must say without being too grouchy this itches a familiar frustration for me which is why can't interested fans have even like cursory updates on minor league prospects injuries and rehab right so i i I get that um i'm not trying to be in anybody's business but like i the twins do i think a great job of like having kind of a news dump every friday of a homestand right where where nick paparesta will say joe ryan's on the 60 day dl here's the latest not expecting him back this year um here's the latest with brooks lee he needs a couple more days on rehab blah 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 i wish we could get even a semi-regular cadence version of that for a minor league guys because we're resorting to he's taking live at bat per his instagram story <laughs> like right. i have no idea where erod is if he's going to return this season it seems like he, he might be close to rehab but um that that feels like a little bit of a frustration that could be avoided yeah and i think part of that has to do with like who's covering the team in the city Hmm. And so we would get, um, you know, I think we, 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 some of that like in Cedar Rapids. And so having people kind of in, in the, in the business there, we know as far as Wichita, there's, there's really nobody. Hmm. And so I think that that makes it a little bit harder because those are the people asking the questions. It's hard to ask questions to people when you don't have access to them. So yeah. it is a bummer because it's base it's been a lost season for him. Um, but I, I do still think that he's got a chance when healthy to be the type of guy that could, that could help potentially next year. Agreed. Just a bummer that he's hurt because he could have potentially been the guy to help. And I said that at the beginning of the year, if Buxton goes down, why not Erod? And the yeah. answer is, well, because he's hurt. Too. Yes. Yes, he is. Sadly. Um, one other, one other pitching note on it. Well, two other pitching notes. One I wanted to touch on with you. And I think we maybe saw this one coming a little bit. Andrew Morris has been promoted to triple A's made a couple of starts too early to really dig into the numbers had a, a start with an uncharacteristic challenge of throwing strikes. Most recently, i um, sure he will be kind of back on track there soon. Um, but again, just curious for your overall take on, Morris, another guy who started this season at IA Cedar Rapids. And it, it feels like um, I'm almost like checking myself thinking I got that wrong. He started at high A. He's now at triple A. Um, I don't know, man. I feel like he's someone who's potentially knocking on the top 100 door for me also. I mean, I feel like that's a little high at this point. But we saw what Zebby did. We saw what Festa did. And you just fall into that rut where it's like every guy is going to be that type of guy. So, um, yeah, oh, the, why not? And and three levels in a year is impressive. And if push comes to shove, is he the next guy in the rotation if they need it? I mean, Barland and, and then him maybe, or Barland and Scrappy and then him. Uh, but he's top 10 in the he, – he's at least top 10 on the depth chart, I would assume. Let's put it this way. Um, and, and, and like, I know that is like a little bit of an aggressive take, but he has had close to a Zebby like season as you could get, honestly. Right. So 22 starts here, 228 ERA, 252 FIP, um, OPS given up 551, striking out 25% of hitters, walking just 5%. I mean, he's dominated every level he's been at. Fastballs up to 96, 97. I guess here's how I would put it, and you can tell me if you disagree. I'm now convinced that Andrew Morris is a major league caliber arm in some role. I don't know what that role is. Maybe it's a starter. Maybe it's relief. Maybe it's a high leverage guy. I'm not sure. Um but I don't think we could have said that at the beginning of this year with confidence. And now I, I do think it's fair to say he jumped up two levels in a year. He's dominated um, this early um, couple of starts in St. Paul, notwithstanding, but he's just getting going here. What, what are your thoughts on that? Major League Caliber Arm, fi- a fair assessment of him yeah, at this point? I think that's extremely fair. And that's what you're trying to do, 
right? Develop guys that can contribute at the major league level. And and like I said earlier, if you can develop guys that can't stick as a as a starter, they become reliever. And so mm-hmm. he puts himself in a position to be on the big league roster, and that's what you want, whatever role it is. Because I, we've seen stars can stars can help win games, stars can lose games. We've also seen relievers can help win game. Bad relievers will lose you games. So all those roles are important, and I and I think it's it's yeah, Morris figures into that equation at some point relatively soon. Yep. Um, we t- we've we already talked about Debbie Fester and SWR all being in the rotation. There's just one thing I wanted to say there is no, no one ask about pitching pipelines anymore, please. This is exactly what it looks like. You literally now have four-fifths of your rotation made up of guys who have been developed in-house. If you throw Bailey Ober in there, if you throw Louis Varland in there, it's five out of six, Pablo being the one guy who's kind of out of house, um, you know, acquired – be a trade. I know SWR uh, was, but he had to go through a good amount of minor league time before before he came up. And I think it is because of the Twins rookie pitchers, not in spite of them, that they are kind of clinging on to this playoff spot at the moment. Um, and that is a major, major win and a major testament to Twins drafting and development. I think three, three guys, three fifths of the rotation, amazing stuff. Um, and then the last note, Jeremy, because people always ask about this too. The Twins have assigned their first two 2024 draftee pitchers to affiliated ball. So Christian Becerra, I'm not 100% that I'm pronouncing that name correctly. 12th round pick, right-handed pitcher out of Cal, I believe. And then Logan Whitaker, 19th round right-handed pitcher out of NC State. Both were assigned to Fort Myers on... <clears throat> August 27th. So you'll be getting our first look at the next batch of uh, Twins minor league arms. Yeah, and and typically the Twins draft pitchers, and we don't really see them at right. all. So if they throw more than a handful of innings, I'd be pretty surprised. It does seem like they, if they sign NDFAs, they'll pitch more, but mm-hmm. the guys that they throw a little bit of money into, they uh, they'll, they'll pitch a lot less. Yep, definitely a great point there. And for anyone who has asked about Desan Hill, like just ask again in 2025. You're, you, I don't think you're going to see him. I, I do wonder about these two guys. Does it perhaps, perhaps speak to the fact that they've done well, you know, in their post-draft camp, um, that the, the org is kind of letting them loose in a ball already? Maybe it's just the fact that Fort Myers needs arms. I'll be curious to see how they do. Well, well. Circle back to them in a couple of weeks after they got some innings under their belt. Um, I think there's, I think there's a lot of different reasons that 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 could come into play. The other thing that I think is is the is a real thing. There's a limit to how many players you can carry. Mm-hmm. So if you're if you're on the fence, and not to say that that either of these guys are, and, and maybe the timing's not right. Like for some guys, you got to see them right away, or see them more, or see them quicker. Because yeah. you're going to face decisions on if they're worth a roster spot relatively early. Because there never used to be that 160 or whatever cap it was. Um, and so you sign these guys, you're obviously not going to cut them right away. But I think that's part of it too. Like we got to get some of these guys in um, that may be on the roster bubble quicker. You're not going to have a, a guy that you gave any money, any significant money to on the bubble. But these these lower signing guys, you you could potentially be replacing quicker. Yeah, great point. Um, you're always on it with that man. You got the historical lens because you've been talking about this for a million years. Um, Appreciate that. <laughs> always catching strays wherever possible. Okay, this is this kind of brings us to what we're going to jump into today, which is we thought it would be fun just to check in with 2024 draftees. And you mentioned just now that we are are unlikely or not going to see most of the pitchers, but the twins did have a healthy crop of college hitters in this class. And almost all of them conveniently for us have been playing at Fort Myers. So we have access to their data so we can see what kind of a start are they off to. And also I think maybe more interestingly, what kind of hitter um, does their data indicate that they might be. So we're going to go through some of their, um, 
drafted hitters from 2024 and just talk through their starts, what you think of them, um, if we're surprised, if we're um, taking much stock in in how they're they're getting going here, and you know we'll just dig into to five or six guys and then call it a day. Um, let's start with Kalen Culpepper. So Culpepper, 21st overall selection. I I feel like let me ask you this before we jump into his numbers. Looking back on it now on draft night, I feel like people's reaction to the Cole Pepper pick was like f- a feeling of being a bit underwhelmed. Does that kind of jive with that's you? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious for what what's the root of that because I liked it. Um, I just never have that visceral or stronger reaction either way if we're picking at 21. So I'm curious why people felt a little underwhelmed by that pick. I think what's really easy to do is you look at the mock drafts, you see where guys are going. Um, that gives you a, an idea of the range. Mm. And um, I think I'm guilty of that too. It felt like that was a little early for him. You felt it was like a high end of his range. Yeah. And and that's not to say that I didn't think that it, it wasn't a good pick. Mm-hmm. They had other picks coming up and I'm like, you know, I thought maybe they could have got him with the second pick. I thought maybe they could have gone higher ceiling with, with the first pick. Um, but the Twins have done a really good job drafting. And so when push comes to shove, I just try to give him the benefit of the doubt. And when he, when he performs the way that he has to start, the, to start his career, it's hard not to. So, I mean, you, you can go through some of these stats, but I think, yeah, you're, the, the 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 truth is is that that's how people feel just based on looking at at drafts. What where was he on the consensus board? Oof, uh, I want to say low thirties. Yeah, like thirty three, oh. maybe thirty four, yep. something like so that. Th- so you tell me a number that's outside of the first round, and yeah. then tell me the Twins use their first round pick on him. That's why people are like, oh, plus it's another college shortstop. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's go. Let's let's jump into these numbers. So, okay, so Kalen Culpepper, the headlines. Uh, I don't think you could have gotten a much better start from him at Fort Myers. He's already been promoted to Cedar Rapids. He was absolutely scorching in a very small sample size at Fort Myers. He had 276, 344, 488. That was good for an OPS just under 800. I will add in from watching a good amount of him that looked he looked really good defensively at shortstop. Um, two home runs, two doubles in his in his first 15 games. Here's where I think the indicators are that he was ready for Cedar Rapids. At Fort Myers, he struck out 9% of the time, walked 8% of the time, 83% contact rate, and a 0% end zone whiff. He did not swing and miss at one pitch in the strike zone when he was at Fort Myers. Um, pretty good. Yeah, only... only yeah. Say again. I said that it's tough not to love that. Yeah, yeah. I think that Chase percentage is the only orange flag. That's high. That was part of the scouting report on him when he came out. The Twins are not afraid of that. They, I think, just well, uh, are not phased by a high chase rate. Um, and, and honestly, if a guy, and I, the percent in zone whiff isn't isn't sustainable. Hundred percent. But if you're that good at hitting strikes. You're probably pretty good at, mm. at controlling the inner side, inner, you know, not strikes, not the, not necessarily the plate, but just off the plate on the inside, yeah. just off the plate to the outside, um, and so you you expand that zone just because you have really good bat to ball skills, and I think that's that's a perfectly good place to be. So if you want to chase a little bit, go for it. Yep. Yeah, that's fair. I hadn't, hadn't thought about that. It's a, a good point. Um, yeah, so Cole Pepper, I think, off to a, a pretty slow start at Cedar Rapids, but I kind of expect that with an adjustment up. I guess my question for you, Jeremy, is like surprised by how good of a start Cole Pepper made. Is that something you expected? Is it neither? What's your your take on his very early going? Yeah, I'm always a little less surprised, um, just because the I feel like guys are getting pushed a little bit quicker and it's kind of watered down Yeah, the, the middle levels of, of baseball um, and maybe the higher levels too. I think guys get to triple a faster. Um, did some, did someone just 
right so i i don't know that i read an article but i think i saw it on twitter and you know the seven minutes that i was on in the last week <laughs> about how it's it's squeezed like four a players hmm. uh, god did parker retweet something I, I don't know but i feel like i i saw like the, the gist of it was that four a guys are not getting their job are not getting jobs um so it's really hmm. kind of pushed things up so yeah he's performing he performed at at low a but the quality of low a isn't as good um and he performed in a, in a really good level um a really good conference in college baseball too so uh yeah none of that none none of that's super surprising yeah. um i think if he was if he was playing really poorly that would that would be a little bit more of a cause for concern so yeah uh, fort myers to to start cedar rapids to end i would guess cedar rapids probably to start the year unless they're like you know what we're going to stay keep keep him out of the cold weather he's going to spend the whole year at double a yeah. um i think that, that that you know that would be a possibility but yeah you're talking about a guy that if he if he performs well at cedar rapids he be he gets promoted you're talking two promotions away from mm-hmm. major leagues and that's a and that's a great place to be yeah i think that the last thing i agree everything you said on cold pepper the last thing i would offer folks is He's really following the Kieschel, like pattern of movement from this time last year, almost exactly. So Kieschel debuted at Fort Myers, absolutely crushed it. They moved him up to Cedar Rapids for the end of the season, kind of an adjustment period there. Then he started the, the 24th season at Cedar Rapids, crushed it, moved up to double A. That's a very kind of easy to trace overlay for me between Culpepper and Keishel, assuming that Culpepper continues to mash, which as we mentioned, he's had a slow start at, at Cedar Rapids, but what, I think it's encouraging. Where is he? Uh, is he playing like exclusively at shortstop or is he moving around? I'm going to, I'm going to not say exclusively without being a hundred percent sure of that. All the defensive highlights I've watched of him have been shortstop and it all looks good i mean he has a really good arm he has surprising amount of range um and athleticism i i think he has a a decent shot to stick certainly through the remainder of his minor league levels and i'm I'm glad you asked that because we have a question about short stops and who's actually a legit short stop in the the twin system which we'll we'll jump to later but cole pepper really promising start um Next two guys, I, I put two guys together. Um, next up, it's Kyle DeBarge and Kadeem Jow. DeBarge is, I would like to label Kyle DeBarge as the Sonny Gray pick because that's what he is. He's the, the guy the Twins took with their comp pick for Sonny Gray. Um, so let me start by, I'll start with the positive. Kyle DeBarge, walking 14% of the time. 78% contact percentage, only 14% end zone width, only chases 18% of the time. That is such a good approach. Like there's all of that is just dramatically above average for the level, which like you would expect probably from a good college hitter in A ball. Also like batted ball data, like his average exit velo and 90th percentile exit velo are like right on average for the level. In spite of that, his OPS is only 644. Um, his average launch angle is two degrees. Sad trombone. Um, he's running a 55% ground ball rate at the moment. Average at A ball is 44%. And then Jao has the same problem. Um, he's hitting 283, 387, 302. Contact rate over 80%. 12% end zone whiff, 23% chase. That's all really good. His average launch angle is negative 0.2 degrees. He's running a 65% ground ball rate, which is almost impossibly uh, impossibly bad. Um, take any stock in these numbers for these guys, the fact that they're hitting the ball on the ground a lot, or just like do not care. They're getting their feet wet in professional baseball. Give them time to figure it out and adjust. Yeah, I think somewhere uh, a little bit ahead of do not care because I, I'd like to look at those numbers and and just kind of see. And so DeBarge, 81% contact rate, love to see it. Um, 12% in zone width. I feel like that's a pretty good, a pretty good that's, number. Yeah, that's good. Um, I guess that's that's Joe. Um, but DeBarge is 14, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah so, so it, Kyle DeBarge is smaller, smaller mm-hmm. statue. Um, 
stature. Is that an indication that he's just wore down after playing a full college season? Like, Interesting. You like to look at different variables. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a, a pick that I really liked. And so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be too negative. I, I do know that the twins know how to teach guys how to create loft, right? Yep. I think Max Kepler struggled with this when he was younger, um, and I, and so I think both of those guys, when you when you see something that the twins have done decently well, um, it's like with pitchers and the lack of velocity. It's like oh that's fine. The twins will fix that. And so I I, I think that they're both. There, the nothing really is alarming. the The negative launch angle is kind of funny. Um, if you have a negative launch angle and you still are hitting almost 300 and getting on 40 percent of the time, that to me is is pretty impressive. You're just you're obviously doing it with zero power, yeah. Uh, because it's hard to hit extra base hits if you're hitting it down from your bat. Yeah. So just to but. I agree with you 100%. I, I do not really care about these numbers, and that's a that's a really interesting point that you bring up about, like, are they just kind of worn down after a long season? I know that Jow was injured for part of the college season, but DeBarge had a really full season, including postseason play. But just to also, like, put some of these numbers in perspective, right? Um, what did we say here? We said that their contact rates both around 80%. Average for the level was 70%. We said end zone whiff um, for DeBarge was 14 and a half. For Jow was 12. Average for the level was 20%. And then Chase, 18% for DeBarge and, and 23% for Jow. Average for the level is 26. I mean, so all so both of these guys are running kind of approaches that you would think would yield good production and controlling the strike zone well as soon as they are able to add a little bit more loft to the ball on a consistent basis you would think um okay one more guy jeremy i want to talk to you about is billy amick um because i i we talked about him a decent amount pre-draft i want to say because There was a lot of reporting that the Twins had interest in him at 21. And I think we both felt that that was a little bit rich. Um, Yeah, so he's had an interesting debut. I think like the scouting report on him is really borne out. So he's, I updated these. Um, These are as of this morning, because he's gone on a little bit of a heater since I was about to get on him on, on a couple of things. But Amex hit 230. 360, 26, um, 70% contact rate, which bat to ball skills were one of the things kind of cited as a, a, a potential criticism. Um, 18% end zone whiff, that's a little high, it's slightly above average for the level. And then 24% chase, also running a high ground ball rate. Um, his criticisms coming out were like too much chase and bat to ball skills. And we talked earlier about how it seems like the twins feel like they can improve chase rates, but bat to ball feels like a little bit more of a challenge. Um, I don't know. I'm curious for your thoughts, but I think if he's running kind of average numbers for the level now, that might look like a little bit of a struggle by the time he gets to like double a triple a level and i know we're prospecting way down the road but i'm i'm curious for your kind of thoughts there yeah amic was just a different type of prospect than those other guys like Mm -hmm. they're and it's you know the, the you draw the parallels where if a guy has a lot of swing and miss capability possibility that's kind of how he is as a prospect too um Winokur kind of fits in that same, that same thing where it's like, man, if we hit on this guy, it's going to be huge, but the likelihood mm-hmm. that we hit is smaller. And so, you know, if Culpepper, you would say it's better than a toss up that he's going to be a, a major leaguer. You know, yep. I, I don't know what the percentage is. He, I mean, there's a, there's a 95% chance that he's a major league baseball player uh, because you're going to give a first round pick that opportunity. And maybe you say there's a 67% chance that he's a starter, um, you know, and, and then whatever, however you want to look at, at that with, with Amick, it's there, there's a, there's a, it's a coin flip that he's going to be a major league baseball player, but then that, that percentage doesn't go 
down a ton for me and that he's going to be a really good major league baseball player mm-hmm. because that's that's what he offers right you have the note in there that what does that say 43 percent yeah that's that's so that's the then the flip side right which is what what the positives were coming out were like easy power so the, the thing that jumped out for me about amig is 43 percent of his batted ball events have been an exit velocity of 95 miles per hour plus, and the average for the level is 34%. So anytime he's making good contact with the ball, he's absolutely crushing it. I think his 90th percentile exit velocity is like two and a half miles per hour above average for the level. It is easy power as, as kind of reported. And I think there's a chance that he could get to double A and be horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, but those are the chances that you that you take. What just happened here? Uh, what did you do with you um our theme just changed to twins off daily different color wow right in the middle of the but i think that that those are the chances you take right you swing for the fences and uh and see what happens for sure for sure so uh, you know really small sample size on all of these guys just the last guy i wanted to just quickly mention before we jump into a couple of questions um that i realized i didn't preview with you jeremy so i'm gonna be putting you on the spot um other standouts there's another couple of guys we're not going to dig into too much now hi my frere kaden kendall Derek bender jay thompson are all playing at fort myers kaden kendall's the, the guy i would cite as like interesting so far hitting 304 364 35 um really elite bat to ball skills in the early going contact rate of 87 percent just a seven percent end zone whiff and he does not chase at all um not a ton of like extra base um production yet but his his approach is really 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 super sound um okay so that's that's 2024 draftees and just some light updates we'll probably do that again at some point before the end of the season um, but want to jump into a couple of questions. <clears throat> Maybe I'm gonna throw this first one to you. I'll get your your thoughts first, Jeremy. Um, so Greg, Greg, Greg is in like Greg, Greg. Um, he said, "Give me a list of first of all, Greg. I applaud you for actually asking a serious question. Give me a list of true shortstops in the Twins organization. So like guys who you feel confident." could actually stick defensively at short. Um, and I felt like this question got a lot harder since Noah Miller was traded away uh, to to the Dodgers right before the season started. Anyone well, jump to my play? Well, I was going to make a Noah Miller joke. Like, yeah, dude can defend the position, but he can't hit himself out of a wet paper bag. Like, that's not a real, like, shortstop. You need a guy that can hit and and play the position. Um, I mean, are we are we saying that Brooks Lee's not going to be a shortstop? I feel like I feel like he's very much a potential shortstop. I, I feel agree. Like he's more, more shortstop than Royce Lewis. I, I definitely agree with you on that. I think that I ruled brooks lee out in my head just because he's already mostly playing in a different position in the majors and i kind of sort of think the twins are vying to scoot him into third base in the long run um although if he's back soon and correa is not back soon maybe maybe brooks lee will get some some more run but i i do think brooks lee is one but i I kind of excluded him in my head as like a, a guy who's kind of already up and was thinking like further down and further away from the majors. Which which is fine. But I mean, if you have a 20, what is he, 23, 24 year old, <clears throat> if you have a guy that can fit into that, yeah, 23 year old, he can be the shortstop of the future. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I can see your list. <laughs> and so I, I think Culpepper is. Um, for now, I do think he offers enough where he could very much thrive in a Willie Castro type, um, setting if he needed to, but Castro could also be a shortstop if he needed to be. This is um, true. I, I've always been a D'Andrade fan. Um, and so I think that he's probably your most like natural shortstop. Yeah. Um, but I, th- you don't have to have a whole bunch of natural shortstops. 
and then I, I'm guessing just based on on you know kind of some things from the past they're they're gonna have some some potential dudes down even lower that that work their way up you don't have to have a future shortstop at every level um and so I, I would I would say Lee Culpepper DeAndrade you have those three I don't think DeBarge is I think he's he's a second baseman um but I mean to have to have Carlos Correa and three others that are basically in succession I think that's a that's a pretty good position to be in if you're the Minnesota Twins yeah for sure yeah, I think DeAndre is interesting. He's so out of sight, out of mind this year just because he had season-ending surgery, so he's done. We've forgotten all about him. Culpepper, I have been legit impressed watching him play defense in the early going. He's just made pretty much every play. DeBarge, might be right. I would say it would be like a range kind of issue for him. Um, so... Yeah, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. I think DeAndrade is the, the one guy who's like the best pure defensive shortstop that maybe doesn't spring to mind right from the jump. Um, one more question for you, dude. I'm, I'm curious for your, your take here. Josiah asks about Deshaun Kiersey Jr. Has he done enough to earn a promotion to the Twins? I'll just run through his numbers quick and then i want to get your your take on what you think here um i pulled this yesterday maybe it's pretty close to up to date so he's hitting 286 364 43 is good for 847 ops 362 woba uh striking out 22 percent of the time walking 10 percent of the time pretty good contact number 75 percent 19 percent ends on with 25 percent chase so it's like really solid overall offensive profile he is outperforming pretty much all of his expected stats by quite a lot um, and has been all year. Um, but has, has Kiersey done enough to get any type of major league consideration? What's your, what's your well, I mean, did Andrew Stevenson last year? Because it's the same. And I don't know. We're not talking about – uh, a guy, I, I was higher on him last year. I, I think if if Austin Martin got hurt and the Twins weren't in contention, you want to bring him up to play some center, fine. Um, 27 years old, batting 294. I I could see him having a, a – him being a fit when these rosters expand if there's not a, another, like, hitter. And I think the Twins will use that spot because they have guys that are hurt. Um, I think Austin Martin's done his part to, to stick around. Uh, but Kiersey could very easily be that Andrew Stevenson-like pinch runner. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a there's a ton of value in that. I think Austin Martin could be that guy if he's if you know if he was going to go down. But like where where do you add him? You're not going to have like you have Walner, you have Larnick, you have Kepler, you have. Buxton Especially because he's left-handed, too. If he was right-handed, I bet he would have gotten a shot already. Yeah, so he just – I mean, it doesn't really do it for me um, because when you're healthy, when, when this team's healthy, he doesn't he doesn't fit into it. If they want to give him a cup of coffee – I think if if uh, it was 10 years ago and the roster expansion were the same rules, if they had a spot in the 40-man, they'd call him up. Uh, I'm guessing his his – contract expires at the end of the year so you call him up you, you give him a little bit of exposure as a, mm -hmm. as a homegrown guy because he battled i mean he he really struggled he's a fourth round pick and you didn't really hear about him for a few years so um you know in the perfect world for him yeah he gets that opportunity in a world where the roster spots are way more valuable i, I just i don't see it happening yeah i think my answer to that question is like by performance yes but by how the Twins roster constructed is, doesn't look likely. I do want Kiersey to get a shot because then this fun trivia nugget is true, though. If he gets a promotion, then the Twins' first four picks and five of their first six from the 2018 draft will have played in the majors. Hmm. Trevor Larnick, Ryan Jeffers, Deshaun Kersey, Cole Sands, and Josh Winder. Not bad. Impressive, yeah. 
All right, that will do us for today. We are coming up in an hour, so we're going to call it a day here. Um, we will be hopefully back in a pretty regular flow with new episodes on a weekly basis now to round out and close out the minor league season. Um, as always, appreciate folks checking out the show. Um, anything you can do so to support it will be appreciated. Um, we'll catch you guys next week, and we will hope the Twins are playing far, far better baseball by then. Till then, catch you next time.